Our legal system is by no means perfect. That's not news to anyone. Over the years, there have been a bunch of laws and amendments put in place to try to allow fewer people to slip through the cracks. But what about the ones that do? Today's story is about legal loopholes and how a man could be found innocent and guilty of the same crime three different times. On May 7, 1985, Tim Hennis, a 27-year-old Army sergeant from North Carolina, responded to a classified ad in his local paper. A lady was trying to find a new home for the English setter, and after talking it over with his wife, they agreed he could drive out to see it. Around 9 p.m., Tim pulled up to the house of Katie Eastburn and walked up to the driveway with the leash in his hand. Tim thought the dog seemed great, so he asked if he could do a trial run of taking the dog home to see how it would get along with his other one. The lady agreed. A few days later, Katie's husband Gary, who was away at Squadron Officer School in Alabama, called his wife for their regular Saturday morning catch-up. When she didn't answer the first time, he called a few more times but never heard back from her that day. On Sunday, Katie's neighbor noticed she had three newspapers stacked in her driveway and her station wagon hadn't moved in days. Nope. Don't like that. The neighbor rang the doorbell several times, and when he heard a baby crying inside, he called the police. An officer cut a window screen and climbed in through the bedroom as he saw 22-month-old Jana crying in her crib. They quickly passed the baby out the window to safety, and when they saw bodies at the end of the hall, they called for backup. In the home, officers found the bodies of mother Katie, five-year-old Kara, and three-year-old Aaron, who had all been brutally attacked. Poor Gary had to fly home and straight to the detective's office where they pressed him for leads. All he knew is that Katie had recently given away the dog, but he had no idea who it was that took it. Crime scene investigators found fingerprints and hair while the luminol test lit up like a Christmas tree. Someone had clearly been in there and tried to clean up the mess. The investigators got their first lead when a man went to them and said that on Friday at like 3.30 in the morning, he'd seen a tall white man leaving Katie's house with a garbage bag slung over his shoulder. He said the guy was in jeans, a knit cap, and a black members only jacket. The man was a janitor and he wasn't used to seeing people up as early as him, so he took notice. He said the man in the members only jacket greeted him pleasantly and left in a white shirt. The members only jackets were such an iconic 80s staple. They're like ones that look like racer jackets with a little collar strip around the neck. They also have one of the most vague slogans of all time. The members only slogan was, when you put it on, something happens. So the detectives came up with a sketch from the janitor's description and started to look through Katie's home to see if anything had been taken. An envelope of cash, Katie's ATM card, and a piece of paper with her ATM password on it were all missing from her things. Tim Hennis was at home with his wife Angela when they saw a special news broadcast on the TV that announced police were looking for a man who drove a white Chevette and picked up the English Sutter from Summer Hill Road the previous week. Tim and Angela were shocked and had no idea that the body they'd heard about in the news was the lady Tim had gotten the dog from. Angela was watching the news and was like, hey hun, you might want to come look at this. They drove down to the station, and when the officers recognized him as the man from the suspect sketches, they immediately took him in for questioning. The authorities determined that the crime took place around Thursday night because Katie had been seen by her neighbors earlier that evening. And Friday morning was when the newspaper started to pile up. They asked him to walk them through everything he did on Thursday night. Right away, the investigators thought Tim seemed impatient and arrogant. Despite that, he did stick around for seven whole hours as they questioned him. He also gave them three different types of DNA samples as well as his fingerprints and palm prints. Tim said he drove his wife and daughter to his in-law's house on Thursday, then returned home after making a quick stop for gas. Then he acknowledged that he did pick up the dog on Tuesday, but said he never saw the lady again after that. He said he actually didn't even know her name was Katie because that's how brief the whole thing had been. But the investigators knew that if Tim was lying, it would be hard for him to slip up. Tim wasn't a slow guy. He'd even scored in the 97th percentile on his Army General Aptitude Test, so this would be a challenge for them to crack him. So that's when detectives brought the janitor back in and showed him five mugshots of people who looked like Tim. The janitor remarked that number five had his nose, but he definitely saw suspect number two that night. And suspect number two was Timmy Boy. So who was telling the truth? At that point, detectives didn't have a warrant for Tim, so he was able to go home. But not for long, because by that evening, they got the warrant and rolled up to Tim front door. As the officers put Tim in cuffs on the porch, he glared at them and said, I hope you guys know what you're doing. Tim's dad then hired two very prominent lawyers in the area who were faced with a difficult task of proving Tim's innocence when multiple eyewitnesses said they saw a white Chevette in Katie's driveway the evening of the crime. And Tim's alibi? He said he went home immediately after dropping off his wife and daughter at his in-laws that day. But interestingly enough, a former girlfriend of Tim's named Nancy told a different story. Tim and his ex Nancy stayed in contact over the years and on May 9th, Tim dropped by Nancy's house unannounced for a visit. Nancy said Tim knew that her husband was deployed in Germany at the time and the two chatted for a bit. At one point, she noticed his wedding band and asked how his marriage was going and he told her that Angela had left him. 
you know, like a liar would. But if Tim was hoping for a casual hookup, he didn't get any encouragement from Nancy, so he left. This story did help the detective start to figure out a motive, though. With his wife gone, was Tim looking for a little bit of love on the side? Investigators theorized that when Tim was rejected by Nancy, he went to see another attractive woman who he knew was home alone, Katie Eastburn. Was it possible that after getting rejected a second time from Katie, Tim was so angry that he snapped? Officials learned that Tim had recently gotten into a scuffle with a fellow employee where he'd picked up extra kitchen shifts to support his family. Apparently, it was so bad he stormed out of the restaurant, which was a red flag for the investigators. Even more sus, authorities found out that the Friday morning after the janitor caught Tim leaving, he took one single item of clothing to the dry cleaners to be cleaned. A black members only jacket. Then they found out that on Saturday, Tim's neighbors said they remembered him pouring lighter fluid into a 55 gallon barrel and keeping a bonfire going for at least five hours. Hey fellas, you ever feel so manly and tough you just gotta burn shit for a couple of hours on a Saturday night? While Tim did go voluntarily to the station with the officers, they said his entire attitude was smug. Almost like he was looking at them going, Try to find something on me, I dare you. Because it was 1985, DNA technology wasn't yet widely available to law enforcement, so they couldn't confirm if Tim's DNA was a direct match yet. But nevertheless, they were still certain that Tim was their guy, so he was sent to court. A month before Tim's trial, another witness came forward with information about Katie's stolen ATM card. The investigators noticed that Katie's card had been used on May 10th, around 11 that night, and then on May 11th, around 9 a.m. Both times, the person withdrew the maximum amount they were allowed to. $150. As it turns out, Tim's rent cost $310 a month, and he was late that month. Apparently, Tim had a history of financial problems and three prior convictions for writing bad checks. And in 1984, he was kicked out of flight school for bouncing checks and lying about it. Detectives were actually able to track down the woman who had visited the ATM three minutes after Katie's card had made the transaction and asked if she remembered seeing the person leaving the machine before her. She said, yes, it was a tall blonde man wearing camo trousers and he got into a small light colored car. The detectives were like, boom, bing, bun, the case is now done. Before the trial, officials offered Tim this plea bargain. If he admitted guilt, he would only be charged with two life sentences and he could avoid lethal injection. But Tim told his lawyer he wasn't pleading guilty to something he didn't do. Okay, Tim. During the trial, the jurors were shown the horrific photos of the crime scene and apparently they were all really upsetting. I mean, obviously any crime scene photo is gonna be traumatic as heck, but these pictures were of a mother and her two daughters who were brutally slain and a baby who was left to eventually expire. Based on that, it's safe to say that people in the courtroom were ticked and they wanted justice. At one point in court, the janitor took the stand and identified Tim as the man he saw the morning of May 10th. He said he didn't have a doubt in his mind. The jury deliberated for 10 hours before coming back with a guilty verdict on all three counts and a sentence of lethal injection. Tim was then sent to a prison in Raleigh where he was one of 17 convicts on the row. Nine weeks after Tim arrived, an inmate was executed by lethal injection. While he was there, Tim received a letter that was postmarked on July 8th, the day he was sentenced to exit the world. The letter said, Dear Mr. Hennis, I did the crime. Sorry you're doing the time. I'll be safely out of North Carolina when you read this. Thanks, Mr. X. What? The sheriff's office also received a letter from Mr. X, but they were never able to determine the real identity of the letter sender. With Tim sitting on last chance lane, his lawyers were doing everything in their power to get his case appealed. And in 1988, Tim's appeal had reached the North Carolina Supreme Court. His lawyer argued that the graphic photographs shown had turned the jury against his client unfairly, so they got a retrial. In the retrial, Tim's lawyers focused entirely on trying to discredit the janitor, aka the star witness. They said he was a thief and a liar because he had a few cases on his record of theft and public intoxication. How dare you come after my beloved janitor like that? They also said his testimony from the first trial was incorrect. The janitor said the weather on Friday night was nice and you could visibly see the stars, but a meteorologist said it was cloudy and overcast. Okay, so we got the weather wrong. Big deal, right? Somehow, this cast enough doubt on the character of the janitor for his entire testimony to be ruled worthless. And here is where everything would continue to go wrong. The original prosecutor on the case had moved into a private practice, so two new lawyers were assigned to the case, and I guess they completely phoned it in. By now, Tim's aggressive lawyers that his dearest daddy had hired some years ago had been fighting every possible angle to get Tim a retrial. Now that they had it, they didn't think the new prosecution stood a chance. On the stand, Katie's husband Gary confirmed that two months before Tim picked up this dog, his wife got some threatening phone calls in the middle of the night. Tim's team also read the letters from Mr. X, then a new pair of witnesses took the stand. A woman who delivered the newspaper said that at 1.45 a.m. she saw a long-haired man driving a light-colored van, not a small 
Chevet in front of the Eastburn home, so it couldn't have been Tim. Then, Tim's lawyers called up a tall, blonde teenager from the Eastburn's neighborhood who often took walks around the neighborhood late at night. This feels like we're reaching. Are we reaching? They asked the kid if he took a walk past the Eastburn's home around three that morning, and he said he did. Maybe this was the person the janitor saw? When the kid took the stand, everyone gasped. This tall teenager and Tim could have easily been brothers. This was when the jury began to doubt everything. What if the guy who just spent two years on the row was actually an innocent man? And Tim's lawyers didn't stop there. Here's what else they brought up as evidence. Footprints found outside of Katie's home that were three sizes smaller than Tim's. They had also found hair that didn't belong to Tim or the victims inside the home. And there was a spot of fluid on the wall that didn't match Tim's or the Eastburn's. Two days later, the jury decided that Tim was not guilty on all counts. After 800 days on the road, Tim walked out of the courtroom a free man and even shook several jurors' hands. Tim Hennis decided to re-enlist in the army and in 1990, he was shipped off to Saudi Arabia for Operation Desert Shield. He raised his daughter, had a son with his wife who stuck with him through the entire ordeal, and even became a scoutmaster in charge of all the little local Boy Scouts. Tim retired from the army in July of 2004 after 23 years of service where his final rank was Master Sergeant. On May 12, 2005, 20 years after the Eastburn family was massacred, a group of detectives met together to rediscuss the case. One important path had still gone unexplored. DNA, baby! The DNA samples taken from Katie's body in the late 80s? Yeah, officials still have the swimmers from all this time, and lucky for them, DNA doesn't lie. Two different samples were tested, and a year later, the results were in. Tim was a match. Basically, when advanced DNA technology became widely available in the 90s, it sparked a revolution in the criminal justice system. Since 1989, more than 200 prisoners, including 17 from the row, have been freed based on DNA evidence alone, which is terrifying. But while it can help free the innocent, it can also help incarcerate the guilty. Years after Tim had been acquitted because of the janitor's credibility, the letters from Mr. X, the Tim teen lookalike, and the newspaper delivery woman, they finally had him again. And that just goes to show the difference a good lawyer can make. Tim's lawyers were so good at casting doubt during the second trial that they had successfully made a guilty man seem innocent. But because of the Fifth Amendment, they couldn't do nothing. As much as some people love to bring up the first two amendments, not a lot of people know about their hot cousin, the Fifth Amendment. Unless, of course, you're an avid true crime consumer like me. The Fifth Amendment states that no citizen can be put in jeopardy of life or limb for the same offense twice. Otherwise known as double jeopardy, if someone's already gone to trial for something and found not guilty, they can't do it again. That amendment was put into place essentially so that if someone was found innocent, they wouldn't be brought back in for retrials over and over again until it's been hashed into the ground. At some point, it's got to stop, or else it never will. That's actually a pretty good rule that needs to apply to exes, too. If you've broken up once already, no more. Pack it up and get a move on, Chad. But what do you do when you know the guy is guilty and the Fifth Amendment is now protecting a criminal? If only there was a loophole. Well, technically, a double jeopardy in this case only pertains to the state courts. So in North Carolina, under something called the Dual Sovereignty Doctrine, a person can be tried and acquitted in state courts and still be tried for the same crime if it's taken to federal courts, which meant that if Tim re-enlisted in the army, they could serve him with a court martial and take his ass to federal court. And that is why people study the legal system so closely there is always a loophole. Officials approached the Secretary of the Army, explained the bizarre situation they were in, and asked him if there was any way he could do a little favor for them. He agreed and approved a request to call Tim back into active duty, as any retired soldier can be, and charged him with the crimes against the Eastburns for a third time. In September of 2006, a military lawyer and agent pulled up to Tim's house with a letter ordering him to report to Fort Bragg within 30 days. And he was pissed. The court-martial of Tim Hennis officially began on March 17, 2010, 21 years after he'd first been declared innocent. On April 8, the members of the jury found Tim guilty, and a week later, they decided that once again, he deserved the ultimate punishment. Finally, on April 15, 2010, Timmy Boy went back to a prison in Kansas where he remains to this day. A lot of people criticized how the military was a pawn for the legal system in getting Tim incarcerated, and they're right. Because technically, if Tim hadn't ever served his country, he never would have been able to have been tried a third time. So how is that fair? But on the other hand, the authorities finally had the undeniable proof that Tim did it all these years later. So if they let him go with that knowledge just because of double jeopardy, how would that have been fair? All I gotta say is I'm glad I'm not a lawyer and I'm glad Gary and Jana finally got justice for their family after all that time. 